Hi, welcome to Dear Art Producer. I am your host, Heather Elder. Today is February 19th, 2021, and I have invited Rachel Perez, a producer at Leo Burnett in Chicago, to be our guest today. Rachel is working on an array of clients such as Marlboro, Pediashore, Bridgestone, Nintendo, and Ready Whip. She is a mastermind of figuring it all out and getting it all done. Welcome, Rachel. Hi. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I when I just read uh, Ready Whip out loud, it made me think of these amazing TikToks I've been seeing. Um, I don't know if that's on your radar or not. Being working on the account, but there's all these incredible recipes that people are making with Ready Whip, and um, that, that makes me hungry every time I think about it. And of course, I'm reading this now, and I'm like thinking about it. <laughs> I know it's such a fun little um, brand, and yeah, there's just so many great little recipes and especially when you're working on them and shooting with them it's just there's so many cans of ready whip and it's oh it's God. a sugar rush for sure absolutely uh, my son just sent me a tiktok of um this we have this air fryer at home and he sent me this tiktok of somebody making chocolate chip cookies in the air fryer and then putting um ice cream and whipped cream on top of it and my reply was like we're absolutely doing that this weekend that looks way too good so oh yeah that sounds delicious <laughs> So you can tell my quarantine has been mostly about eating. So That's okay. I think everybody's has. I think everybody's has, totally. Um, well, thank you for being a guest today. Um, I'd love to start off talking to you a little bit about you know what your path was to the current job that you have. I find it fascinating and a really great way to start off the conversation, just to learn a little bit about your background, because nobody raises their hand in college and says, I want to be a producer, or not a lot of people know enough to raise their hand at that point. So I'm just curious, you know, what brought you to being a producer? Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of people just kind of fall into this role. No one really, you know, goes to college to be like, hey, I want to be a, you know, a producer for this or that. But I went to school for communications and marketing. I also always had this love for photography that I think was developed in high school during like my first graphic arts class where we would go out and, you know, shoot these images and then go back to the dark room and spend all day in the dark room developing these these images. And I just really uh, grew to love photography, especially film photography. And I don't think I ever thought that I could really turn that into some sort of career. So um, I kind of just kept it like going as a hobby. I I always took classes. I even went to uh, Florence, Italy, and I went to art school there and I studied film photography, but I still was like, okay, well, I need to do something real. Like that's not going to get me a job. So um, I fell into advertising through like the account service role. Uh, various internships throughout college and after college um, just kind of landed me in the account service position. And I started my career at a travel and tourism agency in Orlando, Florida, which is where I'm originally from. And I was there for about four years. And then I moved up to Chicago to work at Leo Burnett on the account service side. And about six months into being there and seeing the production department there and seeing exactly what they did and working with the producers, you know, on my jobs, I was like, Oh my God, this is exactly what I need to be doing. This is meant for me. Like, how do I make this happen? And I probably took two years of shadowing my now executive producer on all of the jobs that I worked on from an account standpoint until they, you know, had an open spot and, hired me onto the production department at Leo Burnett. And oh, it's been about four years. Um, it was the best decision I ever made. I could not be more happy with the change. But yeah, it was just kind of a falling into it, discovering the world and falling in love with it and kind of working to make it happen. It's so great. I, I had a similar path in that I was in communications and marketing at a school in Boston and had lots of different internships and they were always in the account service department and for lots of different reasons, one of which being um, that it was you know time for me to make a change and having surrounded myself, I worked on a the Polaroid account. I worked on an account that did a lot of um, photography. I just fell in love with that part of the business and the other 
the other account service part, it was fine for me, but I didn't get as much joy out of the creative part. But like you, I didn't feel like I can make a career out of being a photographer. Like it just, that was just so not on my radar, but like I was organized. I was resourceful. I was, you know, strategic enough to kind of get what I had to do, like what I could be on the photography side. And it just was so much more enjoyable for me. And I loved that a lot. Absolutely. I completely agree. Like for me, you know, being on the account service side, you know, you're, you're dealing with clients day to day, you're dealing with strategy, which I just really wasn't interested in. I, I didn't really care who we were talking to or why we were talking to them or really much the state of the business, even though that's kind of bad to say. I, I was so much more interested in the creative and yeah. building something from nothing and making something happen and working with the creative team and specifically being briefed on a project rather than briefing the team on a project. Right. So yeah. yeah, it was just, um, yeah, it, I guess it was just meant to be, you know? That's great. Well, you're so happy, obviously. Well, tell me then what you do. What does a day look like for you? Because I can imagine it, you have a thousand different things to do no matter where you are in the pecking order there. Yeah, my day-to-day -day varies and no two days are rarely the same. Um, it really depends on what jobs I have going on and where they're at in their timeline of things. I could be just kicking off a new project and looking to see who would be good to shoot with or looking at locations, going through talent, going through props and wardrobe, anything that has to do with pre-production for a project. Um, I could be just coming off of a recent shoot and working through an edit, going through music, recording voiceover talent, coloring the film, doing really the finishing stages of an edit. Uh, with producers, it's really all about juggling multiple projects at the same time and keeping everything on track and hopefully within budget and keeping your creatives happy and your clients happy with the work. Um, like any producer, just figuring out how to get whatever it is that needs to get done, done and doing whatever that takes. I agree. And I think that's so translatable to so many different careers, right? Like in that role as a producer. And I remember when COVID first hit, the, one of the first things I thought of was like, well, we're not in trouble because we're, we're like a, a community of producers here and we don't ever take no for an answer. You know, we're all about figuring it out and how do you get it done? So we're not going to sit back and just let it happen to us. We're going to like roll up our sleeves and, and get in there and work together to figure out how do, how do we make it so that we can still say yes to the creative people who want to create things and create con really amazing content. Absolutely. It's all about saying yes, trying to never say no, and just figuring it out. That's if I had like a definition of producer, it would be like figuring it out. You know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. So has your role changed at all because of COVID or during COVID? No, not really. You know, I think the biggest change that I've kind of experienced is just not being able to be on set or be on location, which is my favorite thing about my job. So, you know, the, the whole pre-production and the post-production, we do it, we figure it out, we, we get it done, you know, via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it is on the computer. And you can really do that from anywhere, even before COVID started. Um, you could really do our job kind of from anywhere. Mm -hmm. But the thing that changed the most, I think, is definitely being on set, being on location and working, you know, through that production in real life <laughs> than on a Zoom. Yeah, I think that is a huge learning curve for everyone. While the technology existed, I was just on a call with someone earlier who was talking about like, you know, she had been Zooming with clients way before the pandemic happened and streaming shoots. But we were, she's like, I was streaming it to the next room. You know, <laughs> she's like, cause they were sitting in the room, you know, they weren't on set. They were in the next room. She's like, I wasn't streaming it halfway across the country. She's like, but what's cool about that is now I have access to clients that I wouldn't have access to because they wanted to shoot locally. And, you know, so it's really opened things up creatively for her and so many other people too. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I Yeah. And I think, um, you know, especially with COVID now, especially when you do have clients on a shoot and it's through a Zoom or, or something like that, um, they can kind of see a little bit more of what's going on, really, because maybe in the normal world, they would just be off in their like video village and they wouldn't maybe be in like the thick of the set or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of, I feel like, are opened up to a little bit more of our world and what we're doing and really seeing what we're seeing on the Zoom call. 
Yeah. I think too, another really challenging part, and you can tell me if you are experiencing the same thing is you have to stay incredibly focused on the zoom call. If you are par- not, not if you're in the studio, but if you're a participant, because what we find happening sometimes is when you'd have a client on set and they would be there and present, they might be in the other room doing work or something else, but when it's time for them to review a shot or check something out, they're there. So you can call them in and there's no delays where we find some hiccups is a client who's on a zoom, but then they're, you know, doing some other work and they're not totally available or present. And you can't just go pull them by the arm and say, Hey, come here. You know, they have to, they have to really commit to, to helping stay on, on schedule. Absolutely. Like you said, just, um, kind of, you know, ringing them and being like, Hey, we need you to just review this, this cut or review this, um, review this shot. And they're like, Oh, well, I'm on a little meeting right now. I'll be back in 15 minutes. And so it just obviously makes the day longer and it just makes everything run a little bit slower than it would be if you were on set. And sometimes putting in jeopardy the, um, the shot list, right? Um, Absolutely. Shot list. Like we've, we have to have conversations sometimes with clients, just like kind of expectation management. Like we will agree to these nice to have shots, these extra shots, but only if we're running on time and everybody is doing their part um, because, you know, otherwise we're just going to pile on if we're piling on shots and people aren't available to to do, you know, give the approvals that they need to. It, it sets it doesn't set people up for success. Oh, absolutely. My first um, production in the COVID world was with a five-year-old little girl, actually. And, you know, we're all over on Zoom and, you know, the client asked for just so much more still photography. We were shooting a broadcast spot, so we were shooting to boards, but then they, you know, of course, asked for all this additional photography, which we're, we're going to say yes to, and we're going to say, okay, we're going to get as much as we can, but we only have one day and we're working with a five-year-old. So we're going to get what we can get. And it, it, you know, it's the exact same thing. If you, you know, we only have 10, 12 hours a day, maybe to get this in and we're going to try our hardest, but you know, if we don't get it, we don't get it. That's so true. All right. So tell me a little bit about what your clients are asking of you right now. You know, are they hesitant to produce? Are they okay with producing? Do they need different type of content now? Or are they feeling like they're, oh my God, get me. I, I need as many shoots as I can get right now because we've been behind? Like what, what, what are those conversations like between you and your clients? I haven't seen any shift from before COVID. I feel like maybe in the beginning, everyone was a little weary to go out and shoot. You know, it was very unknown what was going on, how we were, how we, how are we going to move forward with these productions? Um, And now it's kind of just very normal. And everyone's asking for just whatever they asked for before. I don't have any like asks or um, just, I don't have any odd asks at all, really. Um, so they're not yeah, hesitant they, either. So th- nothing's holding them back. They're just, they're putting it out there and we're trying to figure out how to do it. I haven't seen any hesitation. It's kind of like, hey, you know, we have you as an agency. We want you to go get this for us. We want you to go, you know, develop this for us. Go do it. Um, let us know what the risks are. We'll approve them. Here's the money like go make it happen. Um, and I guess that's what we do, right? Yeah. So yeah, I haven't seen any hesitation, um, except for in the very, very beginning when, you know, a lot was unknown, but now it's kind of just like, all right, what are we doing next? And how are your clients feeling about the risks, right? I think we have, at least on my side of the table, we have a lot of conversations with people about, um, you know, what are the terms and conditions regarding a COVID shoot? And what are we asking of our clients to agree to? What happens if somebody gets sick? What happens if, you know, backup talent, all of that kind of stuff. Do you find that your clients have a good understanding of what's needed from those kind of terms and conditions? I think so. Um, You know, I feel like they've seen the guidelines that we put in front of them and the waivers and the agreements and all of that stuff so many times now, everyone really understands the risks. We also have so many precautions in place. You know, everyone gets tested before we go out and shoot. And, you know, all the PPE on set and all the COVID safety um, managers on set and all of that stuff. So, um, 
you know, I think they assume the risk and they understand it. And they understand that if someone does fall ill or if something happens, there probably will be uh, more costs involved for them on their end because there's really no way of getting around that. But in the end, they still want to make it happen and they still need their spot or they still need their social media piece and their content that we're going to go out and get. So, um, you know, they understand it. I think everybody understands it. But at the end of the day, we're going to move forward and we're going to do what we can to be as safe as we can. And that's really it. Yeah. I, and I know that the conversations too, for me, have been evolving, you know, in the very beginning when we started shooting, there was a lot of conversation about assessed risk, you know, and, and people were nervous at first when they were starting to shoot again. And now we're still having those conversations. But when I bring up, okay, here are our terms around COVID and this is what we what we would ask if something got canceled or postponed, everyone is so it's not the first time they're hearing it, you know, it's not new anymore. So everybody's open to it because everybody wants to do it. They want to keep the industry going. They want to keep their content flowing. They want to be present. And like, it's just, no one's looking to hold, I mean, not no one, there's definitely people are, but you know, the, those that we're having conversations with are looking to keep moving the ball forward. Right. And I think, just everybody, we're all in this together. So everybody understands, you know, like if we're like, Hey, there's, you know, there's big risk involved. We're going to be traveling here. And, you know, there's going to be this many people or, or whatever the case may be. Everybody understands really what's going on because everybody's going through it. So I have never run into a situation where a client's like, I, you know, I'm not going to move forward with this. Like, you know, you guys are going to go do it and you're going to, you know, do yeah. it my way or, or whatever it might be. I, I have not seen that because we're all in this together. True. And <laughs> if we all work together, then, you know, we'll accomplish way more. So I think that's a big part of it too. Like everybody understands it. Everybody's living through this. So let's do what we can to kind of get back to that normal world, but just do it safely. So do you find that your clients are asking or finding anything innovative in terms of production or, or requiring something? Or are you seeing anything out there in terms of innovation? I know Zoom at first was felt innovative to people, but it's, you know, obviously not anymore. What, you know, is there anything like what's next on the horizon? Are you seeing anything? And you might not like. Yeah, I, I'm really not. I think like you said in the beginning, you know, the whole Zoom thing was super new and super fresh to if not everybody, a lot of people, uh, especially to me, you know, not being there and just kind of sitting behind a computer. Uh, was definitely different. Um, and now everyone's got that locked in. Even I would say by like, God, August, people had that locked in and they, they were yeah. ready to go. What do you need? We got this, you know, different apps, different browsers, like there was just a whole plethora of ways to do it, um, yeah. which is great. And I think it really does move the industry forward. And it definitely gives, even if we do go back to our normal world, it, it gives another option in case, you yeah. know, someone can't make it or someone can't, you know, yeah. be there to do something, which is great. Um, but besides that, I haven't seen anything new. I haven't been asked anything new. And I've shot you know, in studio, I've shot on the mountains of Telluride. I'm shooting in Arizona next week on a ranch. So like places where there's no Wi-Fi and people yeah. aren't tuning into Zoom. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing real unique or special recently. Well, let, let's move the conversation a little bit towards estimating and treatments. Do you find right now that the need for treatments is increasing or decreasing? I really feel like it depends on the project. And it depends on the client. You know, there's some clients who definitely want to see a treatment. And then there's some clients who don't. And, you know, we we work with who we work with because we love them and we have a relationship with them and we know we're, they're going to deliver and the client knows they're going to deliver. Um, I think if it's a new idea and it's maybe a new concept and they're like, hey, let's find somebody fresh. I think treatments are good to really understand where that, you know, director is coming from. Mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, if it's someone we've worked with before and the client's familiar and, you know, we're just going out to capture something that we need to capture, I, I, I don't think treatments are needed. I agree. I, I find they're becoming so complicated, not becoming, they are, right? They take up so much time. And I know photographers are 
just they you know they put a lot of, t- of soul and energy and time into it and so much so that when they aren't awarded the job I've heard them say things like, oh my God, I feel like I've already produced this job, right? By the amount of time I've put the treatment in it. So I do find that agencies are are trying when it's not necessary to have a treatment to to speak up on behalf of the photographer and not make them do it. So I'm I'm appreciating that when I see that happen for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, if it's a huge Super Bowl spot or a really special, great idea that they want to see, you know, they have a list of these photographers and directors that they they admire and they're like, I really want to see what their point of view is on this. I think that's totally acceptable. But if it's something that, you know, we've done a hundred times, there's really no need for treatments to be put together. Well, thank you for recognizing that. I mean, do you have any suggestions for photographers who are creating treatments and feel just overwhelmed by the amount of work that has to go into it? You know, what what would you suggest to someone that is on a shoot and can't get the treatment done in time and, you know, really wants to put their best foot forward, but can't, you know, might not be able to get it done in the deadline? What, what would you suggest to them? Oh, man. I don't know. That's such like a hard thing because that's their livelihood, you know, if they're yeah. busy and and they can't get to it, I, I, by no means would I want them to come back and be like, you know what? I just don't ha- have time for this treatment. Although I know I can do this project. I'm available when the project shoots, but I don't have time to spend the time getting the treatment together. Like that's kind of a sucky thing to just kind of take yourself out of it. And it sucks to have the treatment depend on whether or not you get this job. But again, that's the way of the world. And that's the way of the, the, the business yeah. and the business is, demanding and it's competitive. If I've learned anything, this whole entire business is all about people competing against each other. Um, and that's just kind of, I guess the, the way it is. And if you can do a treatment, great. If you're being asked to, and if you can't maybe just be honest about it and, you know, on to the next. Yeah. I think what you're saying about competition is really interesting because, you know, when years ago, when we first started encountering this triple bid situation, it really was the one favorite and then the two others. And if you were the recommend, it was pretty likely that you would get it. And then over the years that has, you know, that's evolved a lot. And now when we're triple bidding, we're, there are three amazing choices on the table. And more often than not, we hear that, you know, it could go any way. Like I've stopped asking who's the recommend because one, I don't want to know anymore. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put just as much work into it being the recommend or not. There's plenty of times we're the third or second choice and we, you know, jump leapfrog either because of the call or because of the treatment. So I don't want to put something in someone's head and get them like bummed out. And also I feel like, you know, it could go any way. Like there's, th- if you've got three incredible choices, you don't know what the what the client's input is going to be in that client meeting and what's going to direct the, the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it's interesting what you said about, you know, there's usually one leader and then there's two others, you know, that they're yeah. like, all right, let's kind of get their point of view. I'm interested in what they're doing. You know, they're doing some really cool things and maybe that's how the creative team is kind of going into it. They're like, all right, well, we're no, we're, we know we're going to choose Johnny anyways, or whoever, you know, right. um, but then, you know, the treatments come in and you could be completely blown away yeah, and go with somebody else. And I also think with the treatments, a lot has to do with money sometimes as well. And sometimes that's the only thing the client's looking at is, well, uh-huh. who's, who's the cheapest? How do we get the cheapest? Or also who, who's giving us the most for that amount of money? Yes. Right? You could have Absolutely. two people who are coming in right at budget or right on budget or whatever from a money point of view, but one person's either giving you more usage or giving you more volume or something. It's like, well, who's got the greatest value here? Absolutely. And I think that plays a big part nowadays, even more than it did, you know, back in the day when there was just way more money in things. Um, you know, I've, I've just seen kind of budgets go down and down and down. Um And I think money plays a really, really big role. And I think for a lot of clients and a lot of agencies, you have to triple bid. Like they, they don't, you know, there's no single bid unless you have an exception sort of thing. 
And it's like, okay, well, we know we're going to use this photographer. Like, this is just a waste of time and a waste of money. And it's a waste of their time and a waste of their money. So there's a, there's a lot of different, I think, positives and negatives about the whole situation. And unfortunately, you know, with a lot of clients, you have to triple bid and whoever's cheapest sometimes wins. And then sometimes the underdog wins, which is really, really fun and special and, and, and exciting and um, cool to work with. But yeah, there's a lot of ways it can go. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. Um, okay. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, Leo Burnett is, you know, the gold standard when it comes to firm bids. I just love working on jobs with you guys. I think the the upfront amount of work is a lot more um, just in terms of the paperwork and the specifics and all of that. But I'm so appreciative of it because, you know, it's very clear. The scope of work is incredibly clear on everybody's end. But there's probably people who are listening that either have not ever experienced a firm bid or you know, have only hear, heard about it in theory or are dreaming about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you like about the firm bid on your end? What, what, what's the, what's a positive part for you? Well, I feel like that's an interesting question because I don't think I've ever not worked with a firm bid. So I don't, I don't even know what the world is of not firm bids because yeah. that's all Leo Burnett really takes. I'm trying to like rack my brain and think if I've ever done a job, that's not a firm bid. And I can't even think of one. You know, when we go back and forth with the estimates and with the bids and everything like that, I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't said, all right, where's the firm bid? You need to put, you know, firm bid needs yeah. to be on here. Um, and it sounds like you you like that. Oh, my gosh. I absolutely love it. Um, I, like I said, I think people on all sides of the table pay more attention. And and I don't mean to the bottom line or to the estimate because everybody's paying attention to that, but to the scope. And to what is expected and what is going to be delivered and what is going to happen on set and all of that. Because there's a lot of times we'll do a bid and if it's not a firm bid, you know, halfway through a project, you know, or an estimating or after an award, we might be like, oh, the client really wants to add this and this. Well, no, like we, and we don't have any more money and, or, oh, the client thought we meant this, but we really meant this. Right. And you're just like, okay, well, someone wasn't paying attention and now it can't become our problem. Right. So I feel like the, the firm bid process makes everybody accountable. It's not just, Ooh, if I come in under, I get to keep a little bit more money or, Ooh, I don't have to do an, an invoice, you know, or not an invoice, but like reconcile the, the receipts at the end. Yeah, I mean, those are actual, oh, yeah. great. I get rewarded. If I manage my production well, I get rewarded. Great. For me and the and the creative teams on our end, for us, it's all about everybody is accountable. Everybody shows up on set and everybody shows up to pre-production knowing exactly what the expectations are and what was agreed upon. And, and if you change from that scope, everybody is in agreement that our estimate very well could change. Um, yeah. And that is what I appreciate so much. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, I never really thought about it from that perspective, but I guess that's just because I've always worked with firm bids and, and when things do come up and a change of scope does change, it's always communicated in all of our paperwork that scope changes, estimate changes. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you, if we have an overage, we have an overage because it was a firm bid if it can't fit into our original estimate. So um, the are so clear. There's just, yeah. you know, and the process is so clear. Um, and I think as a whole, our industry, you know, we would, the amount of money, like we have to build money into our estimates to do invoicing at the end, right? right. And we are rarely, rarely under, the budgets aren't big enough <laughs> where we are going to be saving huge amounts of money at the end of a job. Right. And if you, if you, ask, if you determine your scope close enough and, and specific enough, your, your money is going to come in right on budget. Like right. no one, you don't have so much extra money, but if you're, if you're loose with your scope, chances are you're going to under budget something, underbid something because you don't, you don't have all the clear information. So having everybody on board ahead of time, I mean, I could not be a more, ad, a bigger advocate for the firm bid. Right. And I think, you know, as a producer, if you're a good producer, you're looking at that estimate line item by line item. 
and you're, yes. you know, giving feedback and you're saying, no, that's too high or no, that's too little. You know, we need more money here. We don't, you know, we need less money here. Um, exactly. And that obviously helps everybody in, in the end. And that should make your firm bid just even more perfect and even more solid. I do have a question for you though, if I'm yes. allowed to ask a question of course, um, okay, that, too. that kind of pertains to, you know, the whole estimating and, and bidding process. How do you feel about cost consultants, like external mm -hmm. cost consultants that come in yeah. during the bid process and their sole job is to find excess money, it seems like, to take yeah. out. And it's yeah. like they're getting paid to find excess money. And it's like, you know, you're paying these companies like yeah. that money be in my budget for something better. Right. They have to justify in on one sense, they have to justify their existence and their salary by finding the savings. Exactly. In, in the jobs. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I have to say, I've been doing this long enough that there's some really good cost consultants out there. The ones, especially the ones who have been producers or art buyers first. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate my relationships with those. And I wish I had more access, direct access to cost consultants too, because I think we could do a lot if we were aligned together. Yep. Um, I appreciate the other set of eyes and I appreciate... And I don't mind answering the questions. You know, people are always like, oh, I'm sorry, there's a cost consultant. You know, here are all the questions. I'm like, okay, I can defend my estimate. I'm totally fine taking, you know, that's the account service part of me, the yeah. account person that's like, okay, I'll answer all the questions and we'll get it out the door. Where I think we find frustration is in a couple areas. One is sometimes questions shouldn't even come to us. Like an account person or a producer can say, you know what? You are not, I know your wife gets her hair cut for $200, you know, a hundred dollar hair, you know, I, I don't bring that question to me. Why is the hair and makeup person, you know, $1,200 a day when my wife can get her hair cut for a hundred dollars, right? Like 100%. we all know better than this. It's not the same person. It's not the same type of, you know, your wife gets her hair cut for an hour, not all day on set for, you know, three days. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of frustrating sometimes because I think in, in agencies where the, where there might not be strength in the team that's servicing the client or there might be fear, they, they put it back onto us when I'm like, okay, you guys can, you know, totally answer this. And sometimes like, they, the cost consultants do rattle our cages a little bit on purpose, you know? So I think what happens is when you don't know the person or have a relationship with the person we will put an extra, knowing there's a cost consultant, we might put extra money in. So we have something to cut and that's a waste of time. And it doesn't, it doesn't make that the, the authenticity of that process a reality, you know, yeah. I'm like, so, but I just, I think the good ones are, are well worth being on the team. Yeah. And like you said, I think it, it falls or it should fall again on the producer and the producer should be the most buttoned up, have the most knowledge, have the most information, know how much money you need and how much money you are, you know, spending on every single little thing. And if, you know, the cost consultant's like, oh, well, you don't need this much money for wardrobe. It's like, actually we do. We have six changes. You know, this is the, what the clothes need to be. It needs to be up to this standard, the wardrobe stylist, you know, whatever the case may be, they should be able to answer a good chunk of the cost consultants questions that arise before it even gets back to you guys. Yeah, it's, it's true. But I think, you know, assume goodwill, right? I've always thought that like right away, you know, everyone's doing the best they can and trying the best they can. And everyone, if everyone takes their role seriously and wants to put their best foot forward, they, they will do that. So if it means every once in a while, I have to ask, answer a question I shouldn't have to, or, you know, need to have an extra conversation that, you know, maybe the producer or the cost consultant could have with the account person, like, it's fine. We, you and me, I think speak the same language in that, like, we just want to be accommodating and we want to say yes. And we want to be helpful. Yeah. Um, well, before we, we wind down here, um, let's just talk a little bit about marketing right now. It's such a unique time. We can't do portfolio shows tradition in the traditional sense. I can't come visit you. We can't throw a party. You can't come say hi. Um, all the fun, all the things that made our job really fun. Right. Um, how are photographers and directors, you know, staying in touch with you now? You know, I I haven't seen a lot. I, I think the the normal emails that we always used to get, you know, that that come in and you know that reps send and they're kind of highlighting what the photographer's doing or what the director's doing or, you know, recent jobs that they've done. That's all I've really seen. 
I always, and I've always done this, and I think it's every producer should have this or something like it. Um, I keep a, like a rad list. I don't know why I call it rad, but it's it's just a list of everybody, photographers, directors, stylists, editors, sketch artists, um, anybody. Um, and if I see, you know, an email really come in and, and I did this even with when there was portfolio reviews, when you guys were coming into the agencies, when we were meeting for lunch and coffee and all that stuff. But now I think it's more on, on my job to kind of open that email and take a look at it. If I'm liking what I'm seeing, I kind of put it in my own personal list, you know, for if a project comes up and I'm like, Oh, who do I, you know, who should I find for this? And I have that rad list that I can just kind of go to and go directly to it. And if there's something specific that that photographer did or that director did, you know, I'll put a note in my little rad list. And so I can reference it later on when I'm looking for someone specific, but other than the emails that we get, I personally really haven't seen anything. You might see some stuff here on social media of people that you've worked with before and they're engaging in certain ways. But other than emails, I, I haven't really seen anything. But then again, I don't know what, what you guys would do. Yeah. I, I mean, there there is nothing in person that we can be doing right. where, you know, I'm always, I'm I'm innovating my presentations. You know, before COVID hit, we were doing Zoom website reviews with people anyway. Already we were doing that. But now I feel like you can go to my website. You don't need to do that. Like I don't, you don't need me to take you through that. So I'm, I'm creating different types of presentations that would be of value to agencies, not just, Hey, look at my photographers, you know, um, we're right. innovating how we tell the stories of our photographers too, so that it's a little bit more interesting and they could be presentations that can be, you know, self done so that you don't need me there. Somebody doesn't have to log on to zoom. I mean, zoom fatigue is real. Um, oh Yeah. So I think that's how we're doing it. You know, I think LinkedIn is a big way of staying connected. I think individual connections from photographers to the producers and the creatives is is important, but it's hard. It's definitely hard. And the and the fun part of my job, like I had a photographer tell me the other day, like, I miss being on set and and traveling, not and like going out to dinner and big rap yes. parties, all this stuff. And I he, yes. he's like, you, you never went to the shoots, you know, because so you don't understand. And I was like, OK, I'm going to challenge you on that for a minute. I might not have gone to all the shoots, but like I'm going and throwing parties and traveling to New York and Chicago and seeing my friends like in different cities that are my work colleagues. I'm like, so I'm missing out on that same thing, too. I'm on Zoom and at my desk all day long. And both of us were like, oh, yeah, that's happening to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I I have to say it's interesting that, you know, the, the photographer said that because that's exactly how I feel. I think the thing that I love the most about production and about this industry is meeting all of the crazy, cool, creative people and getting to work with these people. Yeah. And, you know, on a production, everybody is on that set and everybody is working towards the same goal. We all might have little separate jobs and, you know, some might be more important than others but everybody's in it for the same reason. And after you become a family, even if it's a two day shoot or a three week shoot, it's like, you're a family when it's done. And, and you've done something pretty amazing, which is so yes. great. Yes, and that's just like the, the, the best part about this job is, you know, meeting all these crazy cool people and getting to work with them and experience them. And, you know, like those rap parties and all those big dinners and all those discussions and all that stuff. And like you said, you know, nobody really wants to do that over Zoom because you're on Zoom all day. <laughs> so, right. You're on Zoom all day. So anyway, um, at least I do take comfort. And I know a lot of people do, too, that, you know, we're not alone. We're all just trying to figure this out together. So exactly. But keep well, sending those emails because I like okay. them. And I, you know, okay. I, I, I oh. pick and choose what I like and I put it in my own list. Okay, good. Thank you for that. I appreciate hearing that because sometimes we hit send or we schedule an email. We're like, oh boy, I hope someone's going to speak up if they feel like there's too many of them. So thank you for saying that. But you know, if you don't put your name in front of people and you don't put your your people in front of people, it's out of sight, out of mind. That's so, it's a shiny object. It absolutely is. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, before we log off, there's always two questions I like to ask. Um, and one of them is, what is your favorite thing to do on a Sunday? And the other is, if you weren't a producer, what would you be? So for the Sunday one, I would 
it so it needs to be a warm Sunday. I live in Chicago. <laughs> I like the warmth. So on a warm, sunny day, I feel like it's just no alarm clock, good coffee, maybe a good tennis match or like a hot yoga class and like a nice like family dinner or a dinner with friends or something like that. Just like cool, calm, like doing things that I personally love to do. It's like the day for yourself. Yeah. And I think if I wasn't a producer, I would really want to be in the fashion industry. I don't know what I would want to be doing in the fashion industry, but something like that, or I have a huge soft spot for rescue dogs and I work with a lot of rescue organizations in Chicago. So I think I would like be way more involved with that, like manage some sort of dog rescue, be the president of some dog rescue, you know, organization or, or something like that. Just Oh, to make my heart happy, special. Your producer skills? Oh my God. You'd have those dogs and in, in adopted like in no time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> or, or like I've said on this podcast before, you'd be like my daughter and you'd never give any of them away. You would keep them all for yourself. So <laughs> I know I've always said, I want this, I want a house with a huge backyard so I can just fill it up with all these dogs back there. <laughs> That's cute. Oh my gosh. Rachel, this has been so much fun to talk to you and get to know you. I really appreciate it. I think we had a really robust and interesting conversation. And um, I think we shared lots of things that will be helpful for our listeners. So thank you so much for that. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Oh my God. It's been great. Well, thank you. And I hope you have um, a nice weekend. You as well. <laughs>